Before we came on camera, you were telling me about your career at Arthur D. Little. You have been with the firm since 1998 and leading the operations in the Middle East since 2005. To be for such a long time with a firm must be appealing to clients. Surely they appreciate longevity. Thank you, thank you, Hala. Uh, before I explain to you why I am with ADL for such a long time, let me give you a very interesting anecdote of me getting rejected from Arthur D. Little before I joined Arthur D. Little. Oh, wow. Uh, during my MBA days, I was so intrigued by Arthur D. Little, first management consultancy in the world into innovation and technology. I went to their Melbourne office. I was rejected. Then I came to Singapore, again went to Arthur D. Little. I was again rejected. They told me very clearly that, Thomas, your hands are moving. Your communication style is very distractive, so we are not hiring you. But we like you because you seem intelligent and logical, but we don't understand you. And I was really rejected. I'm sure this would come as a surprise to many. And what was your answer to that? So I asked a very simple question again, applying my logical mind, saying that um, you just said that I am logical and I am intelligent. But how can you conclude that if you don't understand what I'm saying? And you just said that you don't understand, right? So by then they decided, OK, uh, they gave me an offer. I had a very, very tough probation period for around three months. And during the probation period, all I had to do is to ensure that people understand what I'm saying. And then I got an ADL and I then remained for 22 years now. Longevity, it's not something very normal these days, but 22 years running. It's true that perceptions and reputations are very important in any industry and perhaps even more so in the consulting space. So, Thomas. Can you tell us more about how ADL started? Like the story of ADL from the very beginning. I don't think many people are aware that Arthur D. Little is the first consulting firm in this world. It started in 1886. Mm -hmm. It was started out of an MIT campus by an MIT professor, Arthur Dehon Little. Uh, we did some amazing projects in the very early days of Arthur D. Little. In 1911, we set up the whole research and development lab for um, General Motors mm -hmm. in, in their premises. Arthur D. Little had 80 consultants supporting NASA for the first landing in the moon in 1969. Oh, wow. Coming to the Middle East, we started in the Middle East in 1950s. We had offices in Jeddah and Riyadh in 1950s. Uh, people may not know that we actually helped set up OPEC. Mm -hmm. Arthur D. Little developed the whole regulatory framework for the telecom sector in 1950s. Mm -hmm. We did the whole aviation uh, sector development, the Ministry of Industry. All of that was done by Arthur D. Little in 1950s and 1960s. Moving on very recently, uh, we did a project to develop the whole space strategy for Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. What should Saudi do in the space sector? We did the whole innovation strategy for the whole country. Uh, the public-private partnership regulatory framework that is just implemented, not implemented, updated, was completely done by Arthur D. Little, right? Mm -hmm. So we are known to um, have very challenging, creative, innovative solutions uh, at the same time remaining very, very pragmatic and implementable uh, recommendations. ADL is known for that, for people who work with us. Yeah. It's interesting that you bring up creativity in terms of innovation and solutions. When you speak about those things and how you approach them, what is the key competitive advantage for ADL? Let me give you a little bit on why Arthur D. Little and how we came into the Middle East. Um, I have been in ADL for quite a while. I used to work in India, in Singapore, in Malaysia. Then I spent a lot of time in Germany and France doing consulting. And in 2006, I came to the Middle East. I started interacting with a lot of clients and I was really disappointed because they said uh, they, were, they had a very negative feeling towards consulting. They actually told me that the clients in the Middle East are not getting a good deal. The best consultants are remaining in developed economies like the US and Europe and Singapore and Asia. 
we don't get the best consultants and i felt really bad because i was already a consultant for around 10 to 12 years and i really started arthur d little middle east to uh, to change this perception because i felt this is not correct they're blaming the whole industry that i've given my life and i wanted to give some very good quality work the best people in the world best recommendations the world in the middle east and i wanted them to change the perception about consulting not about arthur d little i just wanted them to appreciate consulting as an as a as a profession I guess this is the million dollar question here. What sets ADL apart? Two words. Open consulting. Mm -hmm. Okay. What I mean by open consulting is okay, first of all, we need to understand that consulting is a very premier service, mm -hmm. right? The clients pay a lot of money and they deserve the best in the world. Not what a consulting firm can give them because they are paying the highest amount for a consulting engagement. they are entitled to what is best available in the world not what a consulting firm can give them so i think we have an obligation to look at what is best available in the world and give it to the to the client mm -hmm. we bring in experts for example and it may be very surprising to you to understand that some of my best clients today i did recommend them to use our competitors because there were specific projects in which i felt adl is not the right party to do it and i recommended our competitor they worked with them they were very happy but the, a very interesting outcome from that is that any time i tell my client that i can do a project i almost certainly get the project because they now believe that i can i can do it and i again bring in the best people to do uh, the project fascinating is this something that the middle east continues to appreciate Oh yes yes the middle east appreciates this a lot but let me tell you some differences in the middle east versus other economies i don't think there is any region like the middle east that gives a lot of importance to trust mm -hmm. right uh, i think trust is very important in consulting i am not saying trust is not important in europe or us and singapore but what i am saying is in the middle east believe they are coming to you for, to come up with a solution mm -hmm. assuming that they know the problem but actually that is not what is happening we are actually trying to explore and understand the problem itself before coming up with a solution mm -hmm. and it is very important for the client to trust you as an advisor for them to get very deep into the problems they are facing and agree on the problem before you get into a solution mm -hmm. but at the same time when you work in germany or in or in singapore the clients come with you with a problem it's it's a little bit on a transactional relationship right i i tell you a problem please solve it for me in the middle east it is trust based you are trying to explore the problem and hence what i talked about bringing experts open consultants from the market to understand the problem resolve the problem uh, give a very very independent objective answer to the client this is very very important in the middle east mm -hmm. right and we we don't try to give solutions that the clients may be looking at we may give very controversial answers objective answers and again having external experts with you will 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 make it very credible when you are giving tough answers to the clients and trust really helps in such a situation when we speak about consulting in the middle east we are all aware about the current climate due to the ongoing pandemic It is common knowledge that uh, recent events have accelerated reforms particularly in terms of digitization. When assessing the current consulting environment, what would you say is a common challenge for the industry as a whole? If people understand consulting very well, it is always structured by industry verticals or functional uh, capabilities like telecoms, energy, healthcare. But today with the pandemic we started understanding the importance of digitalization it was already very very important there is convergence between healthcare energy telecoms all those sectors and the consulting business is not structured to provide converged recommendations mm -hmm. just to give you a very simple example we want to save energy in this building mm -hmm. a project is it an energy project is it a real estate project is it a construction project and i can also tell you something which sounds a bit awkward in a consulting engagement whoever is leading the engagement let us say it is a healthcare expert the whole project is about healthcare like when you do an economic city development project the healthcare expertise comes in he's trying to take care of the well being of the people in the city 
if it is somebody with a transportation experience he will try to look at the economic city and let us have the best autonomous transportation in the uh, in the new economic city right so it is very important to bring in all various expertises across industries and across functions to provide complete solutions to clients especially in the digitalization era and i don't think consulting firms are structured that way the level one structuring is by industry verticals it is not converged offerings and just to give you one more very quick input is over the last uh, one year we have done consulting in almost every single sector and i can tell you if you implement converged strategy you can save around 30 to 40 percent of the capex it can be real estate it can be hospital it can be restaurants it can be a transportation company 30 to 40 percent of the investments can be reduced or saved and you cannot come up with these outcomes or recommendations unless you have a converged expertise developing the recommendations for the client so with this philosophy in mind and a clear vision led by adl 4.0 where does adl rank in terms of size and stature in comparison to others in the region? ADL is still a very small firm in the Middle East. Um, I think our main competitors are at least three to four times the size of Arthur D. Little. Uh, for us, it is very, very important to maintain um, the quality recommendations, the value system we have. And I was a bit worried in the beginning to grow very quickly because we may compromise our fundamentals and values that we want to hold very tight. But over the last three, four months, I did realize that there are some very good partners in competing firms who like ADL values, right? I'm not saying they have good or bad values. I'm just saying it is different. ADL values and the values of other consulting firm seems to be very different. And I have, I have identified some very, very good partners with very good competitors aligned with ADL values and they have moved to Arthur D. Little. So I have now found out a mechanism by which you can bring in people from competing consulting firms, extremely successful people, but maintaining the value system that we have. And now we are growing. We have tripled in the last three to four years and we will again triple in the next uh, two to three years. And our clients are asking for more of Arthur D. Little. They said, we love ADL, but we know you are small. They wanted us to be bigger. And I'm actually taking going in that track. So we are small. We will be big very quick, maintaining the culture and the values. You're obviously someone who others aspiring for a successful career in consulting will look up to. So for those watching this discussion or those who come to you for advice, what do you say to them? The requirements of a consultant are in contradiction. Let me tell you why I say that. You need to be a very, very intelligent person but you need to be very humble to accept your mistakes and learn from others. The most important quality for a good consultant is that you need to be looking forward to people telling you your mistakes. When you come into a consulting firm, look at your background. You were the best in school. You went to the best MBA schools. You are the brightest student. Everybody tells you you are intelligent, you are smart, you are very well dressed, you know how to conduct yourself. You normally don't make any mistake. So you have created an image that you don't make any mistakes. And when you come into consulting, when you make mistakes, you feel very awkward and you try to cover it up. That is very, very bad, right? When, when in ADL, when we try to hire consultants, I actually have a set of questions by which I force them to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. Level one, I'll ask a second question, a third question, and you can ask questions till they make a mistake. What if they don't? I can guarantee you that I, I've never had an interview in which I cannot make a, a person commit a mistake mm -hmm. because I, I actually manipulate a little bit for them to make a mistake. And normally you can do that on finance questions. Mm -hmm. They make mistake. And then when they make a mistake and how they react to that, is the point at which I decide whether to hire them. And let me tell you something. 85 to 90% of the people, when they make a mistake, they actually feel bad that they lost the job. 10% of them actually feel very happy that they learned something new. They lost the job, they're not sad about it. They said, wow, I really learned something. Thomas, can you explain to me what, did, what mistake did I make? How can I correct myself? I want to learn something more, right? And that is the person I hire. 
because he's he's very humble he is willing to accept that he made mistakes these are the people who will teach others there is no competition between uh, colleagues right uh, and i encourage this culture a lot in in in, in our thirty little yeah. yeah and i think it is very very important for consultants to have this value so i'm sure like this philosophy helped our thirty little oh yes yes very much very much and look at the philosophy that i'm trying to encourage we should be willing to learn and we should be willing to teach and you will be very good if your colleagues are very good so you should be very happy to have very good colleagues with you mm. right so in r30 little everybody's movement and progression is more related to your performance the performance another person is not relevant for you we don't have that you have to move every 2 to 3 years if you don't move you will be you will be asked to leave there are firms in which you say if you don't move in 2 to 3 years you have to leave the firm in adl you perform you stay if you perform at a higher level you move up your career progression has nothing to do with your colleagues so technically it is better to have better colleagues than you becoming better than them because you learn from your better colleagues and you move faster you mentioned team spirit and this is something that is very important with any team leadership and direction are important so in your opinion thomas what makes a good leader again i have i will give you a very simple answer maybe it is it is a normal to everybody or sometimes people may not accept this a very good leader is a person who starts by assuming that he doesn't know anything mm. because you try to bring in the best people around you in adl the partners i have hired are from firms that i could not get a job with the schools i go and bring in consultants from are the mba schools i could not get an admission so i am trying to bring in people who are much much better than me and i think that is a it's a very good quality to have that in a leader because normally people tend to say that the leader has to be better than others that's why you are a leader no completely wrong philosophy you assume that you are the worst in the lot and get the best people into the company and that is the only way the company will become better and better second very important criteria is you have to be very non hierarchical very flat organization structure very open to people to come and criticize you because look at the contradiction right when we hire people we try to bring in very very intelligent people but then you tell them what to do that is not correct right because if you are if you are if you believe that you are bringing very good people better than you then you have to give them some freedom to do what they like because if you try to control them then you are trying to make them look like you and you in the beginning i said i am trying to bring people better than me right so you should allow them flexibility right and you should allow them to make mistakes and and help them when they make mistakes and it's a very entrepreneurial flat structure with amazing people around you and one more very important component is about ethical behavior right because as a human being all of us are actually very very ethical almost 99.9% of the people are ethical you start behaving unethical because of that is what you believe that leader may be indirectly telling you thomas you may have to give a recommendation like this because the client is asking for this and you believe that you will lose business and losing business the leader doesn't like it and i start becoming a yield to that no if the leader is very ethical and he encourages ethical behavior even if the company collapses or the digital collapses because of ethical behavior i encourage that i'm really enjoying this discussion but here comes my last question what would you say is the most important philosophy that guides you as a leader and as a professional I may be repeating some of them because what I told you some of the most important things for me to start with again I have to repeat that get the best people around you right for I always do that yeah the second very important philosophy is that I never ever sell something that I will not buy as a client again I'm repeating so if you come to me say Thomas I want you to help me in doing something and I come up with a proposition then i put myself in the client shoes and i'm not thinking about what the client knows i'm thinking about what i know about my offering which is much deeper than what the client knows and then i think with all the knowledge i have about what thomas is offering if i was the client will i buy it 
and if i will buy it as a client then i will sell it if not i will never sell it if i will not buy it it actually puts pressure on you to give the best in the world for the client not what is in other deal it because i when i am offering i know what i am offering is it the best in the world or are there something better outside there then i will package it all in the whole packet that is why the open consulting digital uh, digitalization all of that comes in the picture we structure the whole engagement team with the best people in adl and the best people outside adl and now as a client i would have 100% bought it and that is when i sell it if you follow this philosophy having the best people everybody around you should be better than you allow them the freedom to uh, learn teach give pragmatic ethical recommendations and you will sell it only if you buy i cannot imagine how a client will not get an amazing outcome from a consulting engagement right and all of this again is going back to my the my very initial answer i gave you that i was very sad when the middle east clients were very skeptical about consulting right they felt that we are not getting the best and if you follow this logic i think everybody should follow this logic middle east will have the maximum value and they'll be so happy about consulting as a profession versus having a negative view about consulting thank you thomas it was a pleasure thank you very much ala very good Thank <music> you.